There we go. I guess we'll make there it we... official. Uh, welcome yeah, everyone go. to the uh, September 5th Ham Science Zoom Telecon. Uh, today, uh, if you saw the posting on the Ham Side Google Groups, we don't have a, any sort of agenda or any speakers or anything else lined up, but just more of a, a little bit of a meet and greet as we, uh, at least in the U.S. and Canada, wind down from the, uh, the Labor Day holiday over the weekend. So I, I know I took a, about a week off and didn't do much Ham Side related myself, a little fiddling with the, at the website, but Nothing too significant. Uh, took the opportunity to get on the air a little bit, do a little contesting, and there'll be some more of that coming up this weekend in the, uh, in the CW realm, anyhow. So that's about that. Jamal, I haven't uh, had any chance to look at the, at the paper that you sent. Uh, I don't know if you've heard back from Bill or Nathaniel. I know Nathaniel's been quite busy as well. But as I say, yeah. I was kind of uh, on holiday this week. So Yeah, I put up for Shivas. Very good, very good. So, Carl, thank you for, for popping up and uh, reminding us how important the smooth sunspot number is, right? And that's usually what uh, we don't, we won't know what the number is for, for, for this month until what, about six months from now? That's how the, the smooth sunspot works? That's correct. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's how solar cycles are measured and it's six months behind the uh, monthly numbers so oh well takes all the spikes out though <laughs> no that's good that's a good thing so yeah. mary lou are you uh are you glad that the grl paper is about to get uh, submitted i know you've been working pretty hard on it i think May not have her volume. Well, I have a question for Kuldeep. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Hi there. <laughs> Do you live anywhere near Montclair? Do you know where the Bluestone Cafe is? <laughs> I am in Newark, so I live near Montclair, but I don't know where that cafe is. Yeah, I'm I'm in Newark, so I can't hear I, you. You 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 may have an, an audio problem, Mary Lou, because we can hear you. We can hear him. Yep. Uh, okay. Let's see if uh, does that help a little bit, Mary Lou? That's better. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hey, I am I am in Newark, so I am definitely near Montclair, but I don't have any idea about that mo that cafe. You have a car. No, but I can come. <laughs> we could get you from a bus, right? <laughs> Ed and I meet at this cafe. It's a very good cafe and have coffee or breakfast or lunch. And so I think we need to tell you about it as well. So Pan The pancakes are worth the trip. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Blueberries in them. Mm -hmm. But we should talk, okay? Yes, sir. Mary Lou, is it uh, true that Montclair is one of the cities that has uh, outlawed uh, the gas-powered leaf blowers and other noisy uh, outdoor tools like that? Yes, it is. However, some people still seem to do it. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how. I'm I'm tempted to go and shout at them, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, one of the nice things about Montclair is that it has now become the restaurant capital of northern New Jersey. So it's a little town, 40,000 people, and we have over 100 restaurants. All wow. different types. Many, many different types. Is it the uh, pancakes, so we go to the, that one, but there are many others as well. Is it the, the proximity to the road? Is it easy to get? To mind, Claire, or how do you what do you think attribute that to? I think part of it is it's on the main line of railroads coming out of New York City. Hmm. The 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 Booten line, so the, the line that comes west and then up into New Jersey. Hmm. It's not hmm. on the Amtrak line that goes south to Philadelphia. Yeah, and, Mary, and Mary Lou taught there, so that was just enough reason to put a lot of restaurants there. So Oh for heaven's <laughs> sake. <laughs> <laughs> there 
There you have Therein it. Therein lies the source, right? Therein lies the source, right? Um, but I don't know, it's very, very good. So All I right. thought we, we need to take cold deep to this one. Yeah, I will ask the details from you. <laughs> do you teach At on this? A, do you teach or have meetings on a Friday, generally? We have uh, our group meeting, department group meeting on Friday, 11 to 1. Yeah. Are the other days are fine. Or in the evening on Friday. I have meetings in the evening. Ah, okay. Wow. Sometimes astronomy clubs meet on Friday evenings. Um, but maybe we could go to dinner sometime. Yes, yeah, sure. I don't know if you always like Indian food, but there's several good Indian restaurants here, but there's other things as well. So. <laughs> now the, uh, the, the Hamstein workshop in March will be at the NJIT, I understand. And if that's the case, are we, are we close to Montclair or is that, is that near you or? Five miles. Wow, okay. Not close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. Five miles out here is, it's a distance compared to other it's places. It's like 30 minutes in traffic. That's how you yeah. measure it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you have a place for, so Gareth, do you have a place yet for the banquet? Uh, we have a backup place already for the banquet. We're trying to nail down a place for the banquet now still. Um, okay. You going to do yeah. something in the iron bound or what? We were thinking that uh, we were thinking somewhere closer to campus as well. Um, unfortunately, the place that we did it back in 2018, uh, Iberia, is is uh, probably a victim of the uh, of uh, when the restaurants took a hit after COVID and didn't kind of survive. So, um, oh. so, but we haven't nailed it down yet. But we're I think we're getting close. But uh, we're, okay. we're we're finalizing some of the bigger picture details so that we can tell people with confidence when and where it's happening and where we might have the banquet and who might be at the banquet, that kind of stuff. And as soon as we get those details, uh, we'll put it out there for everybody. If, if you need any planning. help, I, if you need any help, I'm only five miles away. <laughs> yeah. yep. Yep. Right. And I've already raised my hand and thank you for raising yours, Garrett. So yeah. Yeah. I did reply to you today. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Hey, while we've got the Gareth on, I was uh, working on some things in the Hamstein website, and I was poking around the National Science Foundation and found their uh, their grant locator. Uh, their 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 search engine worked extremely well. I just typed in the word Hamstein and came back with about twenty grants in the last uh, six or seven years, I think it was. Um, some of the projects we've all worked on, been involved with uh, the Hamstein workshops and grants, and so on and so forth. I'd like to uh, just share my screen real quick. Gareth, you can confirm if I'm in the right spot. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, it looks like, is this the uh, the new grant starting January 1st, 2025 that uh, you yep. and uh, Nathaniel, yep. Yeah, that's the new one, yep. Okay. Daisy so check. So that's, I know this is the one. What's that? That's the one, that's the one at least NGIT's uh, um, affiliated with, I think there's another one below that. Uh, so you got uh, Case Western Reserve, Chris Zorman yeah. and Christina Collins. I know this is hard to read. There's you and Yeoman. Yep. And uh, Travis down there, University of Alabama. So that'll be Bill Engelkey. Yeah. And of course, our, our buddies at Scranton too. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. The nice thing about this, you know, you can, you can go to nsf.gov. And uh, it, it, I very easily found their, their grant tracker, grant search tool, and, and, and type in Hamstein and see this. But this basically is the grant that uh, this project will provide the backbone of the Hamstein Personal Space Weather Station Network to enable a range of scientific investigations by deploying 30 standardized stations capable of observing HF Doppler shift, HF amateur radio transmissions, and very low frequency transmissions and natural radio emissions and the geomagnetic field. In addition, and this is what I learned by reading it, uh, 10 fully automated GPS disciplined amateur radio transmitters will also be deployed 
to serve as a new source of GPS stabilized HF beacon signals. So I'm guessing those are the uh, Paul Elliott's whisper sign units they can transmit on, uh, on multiple bands, up to eight bands at once, uh, creating whisper data. So it's uh, kind of exciting to see some of the things that I've heard you guys all talking about, to actually see it, uh, so to speak, in print. Uh, actually, as part of the grant, so so a nice work on on getting that approved. Yeah, it's um, Hamsai is becoming really a a, a force in uh, and and well known, right? Simply because of its effectiveness, but also its breadth in science, um, but also just its ability to engage um, the broader community, right? Um, and the citizen science community. I, I, there's very few programs that can kind of match it and and so um and so when it's we feel really confident when we put together a a proposal that you know is has a good idea and is um and is kind of well thought out because we know that the the reputation of ham will just kind of do a lot of the legwork as well with the program officers and such so no it's good to see very good to see um, any other questions or observations or uh, interesting things people have perhaps been, been doing, getting on the air, doing a little bit of amateur radio uh, transmitting as well as, uh, as receiving on this group? I'm not sure how many, how many uh, two-way operators we have here. I had, um, I've been off the air since about uh, the 6th of last month. We had a storm come through and it had some gusty winds and we had some, uh, really heavy side blowing rain and um, the uh, meteorologists in the area believe that we had a, a, a downspurt or a, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, Microburst? Yeah. And it basically it took out my one of my tree's branches, which fell against my UHF, VHF and my HF antennas and crashed them so it took me until about three days ago for all the weather to get right and three days ago three days ago i got back on the air and everything was working i was so happy <laughs> <laughs> i have withdrawals <laughs> nice good to hear that you got everything repaired and it's, it's working again that's a good feeling too i mean if you hate to see the stuff get damaged but it's also a feeling of satisfaction when you get it back together again. So well, this time I this time I made improvements. Over three years ago, I made it a arm off of the mast. It was made out of PVC that I had the inverted V run off of. And this time I made it out of uh, metal and insulated it and everything. So and put a support beam under it. So rather than coming out like a T, it 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 has support on it. And I've got, then I added a pulley system this time so that um, I can, like a flagpole, literally I can loosen it up and lower down the uh, uh, inverted V, work on the uh, ballon if I need to, check the wires, and then like a flag, put it back up to the top of the pole again. So I'm happy with that addition because I, I have a telescopy mask and it's a pain in the tail the you know you need basically eight and 12 foot ladders to lower the mass anytime you want to do anything to the antenna so an improvement <laughs> so very good Gwen okay. I, I saw your hand up too have you been uh, active on the air at all uh, well I tend to uh, do almost continuous transmissions on uh, FST4W, trying to be one of the the proponents of that much uh, underutilized but effective mode, um, and but but not in parallel as uh, from Paul's whisper sound, but um, using uh, a wonderful little uh, Danish uh, device, the RF zero. Uh, if any of you have come across mm. it, then it uh, comes. GPS disciplined and uh, is capable of band hopping. So uh, single band at a time, but uh, different two minute intervals are on different bands and you can set night time and day. 
um, and it's a wonderful little device. Uh, so I band hop FST four W uh, between eighty, uh, sorry, forty meters and uh, and fifteen uh, with the RF zero, hmm. uh, while also listening on on the Kiwi. Uh, I, I, I do have, if there's uh, opportunity at some point, a, a one slide uh, with two notes of caution that have caught me out the last couple of weeks to do with whisper data. Um, uh, so it's yeah, not the please, technology, uh... it's, it's the data of whisper. And I'd, I'd hate anybody else to uh, spend an inordinate amount of time on these two gotchas. Yeah, please go ahead. That may, it's a good thing I turned the recording on. So we've got uh, some- oh, Okay, oh. yes, yes. Well, I thought I'd, um, uh, oh, sorry. I'd, um, oh, I, I better bring up my slide, hadn't I really? So, uh, so if I do that and then uh, share, and I should see it in my list. There we are. Uh, okay. So are you seeing a PowerPoint slide? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So if I go to a full screen, am I still with you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so so I, I was working on a poster for the UK National Ham Fest uh, later this month. Uh, on uh, April eclipse data, and I just couldn't get two databases to reconcile in the number of spots. Uh, and it, it, this has passed me by that there are two knots of caution here. They're both on this one graph, and they're to do with the historic data if you try and access the historic data from whispernet.org CSV files, which some of you may well be doing for the October and the April eclipse, or if you use the SQL facilities on uh, whisper.live or whisper.rocks that enable you to query uh, the whisper.live database copy of whispernet.org, and in particular between those two dates. So those dates span both eclipses. You will likely have missing data. Um, sorry, oh, my, my spelling mistake there. Uh, on the hour and for six to eight minutes afterwards. So uh, the, these are spot counts of everybody globally on 21 megahertz uh, from 1600 UTC to uh, mid, uh, on the 8th of April for the uh, eclipse until midnight uh, that day. And the dropouts are, uh, and the, the, wisp, the whisper dot live data is the, are the yellow dots. And you can see here each and every hour and so for two minutes, uh, zero minutes, two minutes, four minutes, six minutes, you start to get a recovery. And uh, here is minute eight. So it's not quite up to what it should be up here, uh, each and every hour. So that could be really quite serious. And why I spotted it was that the eclipse seemed premature. I was expecting a drop in the spot numbers at on 15 meters across the Atlantic, but it occurred too soon. And it wasn't the eclipse. It was this housekeeping on whispernet.org that happened every hour. So uh, a, a note of caution there from those two databases. Thankfully, and these are all the points in green, Rob Robinette's Whisper Demon copy of the WhisperNet data is acquired in real time every two minutes, and he doesn't mess around with it. Uh, it stays there. So bad points will be in there. They'll stay. They don't get tidied up, but no, uh, there are no dropouts in that database. So um, and and WhisperNet.org 
sorry, whisperdemon.org will tell you uh, how, how to access that, that particular copy of, of the whisper spots. And then the other caution that again I fell down on was what are all these spikes? They occur every 20 minutes in the whisper spot count. No. Oh. And uh, I'd lost track, clearly. And where these come from is that they there must be a lot of whisper transmitters feature in WSJTX, and they're all using the default setting of the band hopping is zero minutes on 160, two minutes on 80, four minutes on 60 meters and so on, and 16 minutes past the hour on uh, 15 meters, and then it recurs on a 20 minute cycle. So for on, on 15 meters, for instance, you get an upsurge of spots because of those people band hopping using the same schedule at 16, 36 and 56 minutes. So what that tells me really is that, again, if I want to look at trends, I can only do it by totaling the spot count in 20 minute intervals. Otherwise, I'll get artificial spikiness like you see here, purely from the number of people using the exactly the same band hopping schedule. Anyway, my two notes of caution for Whisper users today. You are muted, I guess, Gary. Muted. You're muted, Gary. All right, thank you. Sorry, I that was very, very good, Gwen. That was, I think that'll save a number of us, I'm sure, some headaches because, uh, I mean, a person like myself who doesn't do a deep dive into the data, right? I don't know how, but um, you you tend to you tend to want to trust what is there, and mm -hmm. uh, and draw mm -hmm. your conclusions. And you, uh, as I think we've said in this call many times before, the most important thing is to hit the old. Uh, Hmm, that looks funny, you know, and then dig into it further. Wow. Cole Deep, does that uh, give you any insight? Because I know you've been, been asking some questions about uh, uh, the, the continuity of the data and, and, and some, of the, some of the things you've been seeing as well. Yeah, that was nice <laughs> to see that because of the scheduling, we can have certain jumps. So 20 minute averaging will help. Yeah, thanks. So Gwyn, right. do you have any suggestions as to how to uh, avoid this problem in the future? Can you ask people to have a slightly different schedule or something where they don't coincide? How would be best to do that? Um, I, I think that we I probably need to uh, go on to the forum of the WSJTX development group and um, I, I either directly or uh, so, sometimes I do correspond with Steve Frankie, K9AN, uh, directly, uh, especially where you know, a point has emerged from our sort of science use of Whisper data. Uh, and I think, you know, he he takes those things qu quite seriously as to um, uh, what, what can be done. Uh, because if you're only on single band, you, you can have the, you know, a one in X schedule and there is some randomness to it. But, but this band hopping seems fixed. So I'll need to delve into it in more detail. But I have two potential routes. The first thought that comes to mind is, as you say, the software developers uh, should maybe instill some sort of randomization so that everyone isn't defaulted to the to the same schedule as you say. Because uh, if you if you depend on the users to make those settings, um, well, they they may forget, they may not understand. But if the the software uh, implemented or pushed some sort of randomization, that that may help it in the future.
They need some lava lamps, right? Yes. <laughs> Bubbles. <laughs> well, thanks again, Gwen. That was good. Somebody okay. else, uh, there was yes. anybody else that had their hand up when I was talking about transmitting and operating? If I, Oh, yeah, Dennis, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I had actually three things to add in here. Uh, I was a remote operator at N5J, mm. uh, the recent Jarvis uh, de-expedition. Uh, we made almost 50,000 FT8 contacts over the course of two weeks. Mm. And uh, using the new Superfox uh, mode that they the developers came up with. And I'm sure with the different little bugs we found here and there in the code, the developers, at least at the moment, are all quite busy. Uh, but that that was kind of amazing operating from sitting at home in my bedroom, operating through a little remote island, hmm. uh, you know, 5,000 miles away. Uh, and of course, several things happened that were exciting. There's a, there was a CME in the middle, and we went from, oh, 150. I talk about rate all the time, 150 stations an hour. We went from 150 stations an hour on a band to the next day, same time, 30. Wow. And you would sit there, and this is, a, for ham radio operators, this is a needed country. And to sit there, call CQ, and have 30 answers in an hour, uh, it was just, the, the bands were just that bad. Uh, we did make our overall goal of... Uh, 100,000 contacts for the two weeks that it was there. And for others that aren't familiar with it, it, it has what they call a radio in a box concept, where there's, a, there's a, a marine vehicle that's all loaded with antennas and radios, and it's driven on shore, and they undo everything. From the time they dropped anchor to the time we had five radios on the air was four hours. And that's that's pretty amazing to have a go that fast. So just uh, so so that every everybody's uh, on the same page. So so hams, most of us like to collect or increase numbers of have how many states, how many countries, how many different entities, how many Pacific atolls you have worked. And the way it's been done for close to a hundred years is a, a huge amount of manpower was invested in putting people in boats. And as Dennis said, with radios and generators and moving them out to these rare islands, they could be Pacific Atolls or who knows where. But it, it, because you had people there, you also had to have things like kitchens and bathrooms and showers and so on and so forth. And that got to be kind of an environmental problem. Many of these areas that we wish to operate from are very, very uh, environmentally sensitive. So, so this group came up with this idea of a radio in a box as Dennis described it, where you can launch or land a radio station, but remotely control it by a satellite, I'm, I'm guessing, from all, all sorts of points around the world. Is that right? Yeah, we had six radios all tied in, uh, the, all operated remotely through one Starlink link. So, and yeah. Nobody, it, uh, and, and nobody got on Elon's bad side and he kept the Starlink going for you, huh? So. <laughs> Well, out in the middle of the Pacific, I guess there's nobody to offend out there. Because <laughs> the, the island itself uh, is closed. You can't just go there and walk on the island. Uh, you require all these permits from U.S. Fish and Game. And basically, for an old-style de-expedition, they weren't allowing it. But they agreed to try this. And as part of the arrangement with the U.S. Fish and Game, they had to take three biologists on the boat with them that oversaw the whole operation. They had to put uh, flags on the antennas and all the guy wires holding the vertical antennas up because all vertical antennas. Uh, they had to tie all these brightly colored pieces of plastic on there so that the birds wouldn't run into them. Uh, but it, it was quite an operation. And of course, I got to sit at home and operate the radio from here. What uh, what did they use for a power source on, on the reef, on the island? They did use generators. Mm. Yep. 
uh, and they had gasoline to run the generators. Yeah, and I know. They, they, interesting, because they worry about fuel spills and exhaust and some of that in some of these places, but apparently they got around that. So, Well, whatever the U.S. Fish and Game set up as criteria, they met. Uh, so, so anyway, that was the first big thing. Uh, also, I there's a, a about that. So, so Dennis, there were people on the boat, though, right? Yes, there are five people on the boat, and they Plus were allowed. Plus the three to, geologists, or no, no that the, there were eight people. There well, there were five hams on the boat plus three U.S. fish and game people, plus the boat crew, which weren't counted anywhere. <laughs> but but so, they didn't, didn't stay on the island. They stayed in the boat. Nobody was allowed to... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the US, U.S. fish and game people, I believe, stayed on the island overnight, but none of the hams were allowed to. And there was no latrine or anything set up. Uh, all that was done on the boat. For two weeks. Ten, yeah, I think 12, 12 days to two weeks, something like that. Yeah, and there's another one coming up in a couple of uh, weeks that's going to go to another little island out of the Pacific, Rotuma. And that, that's going to be a little different design on how they're going to do it, but it's the same concept. They're going to have remote stations and, and uh, people all over the world. In this case, I think they have 30, what they call youth, which for hams is anyone under 25, uh, spread all around the world that are going to be operating the station. That's fantastic. And the second thing was the... Uh, Worldwide Digital Contest was held a couple of weekends ago. And uh, that's FT4 and FT8. And I participated in that. And so far, anyway, I have the top low power score in the contest. Yeah, that was fun. How many, uh, how many, how many contacts? 999 contacts. Okay. So is that 100 watts and below? Is that considered low power? That's correct. 100 watts. I don't like operating FT4 and FT8 at above 100 watts. I really don't feel it's necessary. But this is located in your house, not on some island. Oh, actually, it's it's located 70 miles from my house. Uh, I have a friend that has a ham radio station, and we put all the uh, computer and the radios in to remotely control it. So I do all the, all the move antennas, turn antennas, select antennas, all done remotely. So where is this? So, where, what state are you in? <laughs> Massachusetts. So where, and where is this? Is this remote this, site also in Massachusetts? The station's in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, and I'm in Ma and Marlboro, Massachusetts. I also have another station I could use that's in uh, Ontario. But that's right. That you have a Canadian away. license as well, right? Correct. Yep. That makes but it legal. It, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can only operate remotely in Canada if you have a Canadian license. But that's that's further away from Europe, and Europe is how you get successful in contests. Dennis, are you using remote hams or the orb uh, app that you can run? No. Uh, when we first got involved in this, I'm going to say 12, 14 years ago, about the only way around was using the uh, uh, RRCs, uh, the Swedish company. I can't think of the name of it at the moment. Uh, but it works only with a select few radios, the Yellowcraft K3 being one of them. And so we have K3s on both ends. And it's it's 
the hookup is pretty slick because it's just like you're operating the radio in front of you. You turn this knob and then changes it down 70 miles away. Yeah. Yeah, for the um, remote hams, I've tried that a few times and that's pretty interesting experience. A friend of mine went one further, a uh, step further, and he bought the control head for remote, uh, remote hams and it looks like a uh, 705, but he can control everything, but it's just controlling the radio, you know, 100 miles away. So. But to control the station up in Ontario, uh, we use AnyDesk and log into N1MM logger program and operate it all remotely via that. Very cool. But there are so many easy ways now, you mentioned a couple, to operate a ham station remotely. Uh, we also have uh, Mumble. We transport the audio with Mumble from Canada to wherever. <laughs> so as they say, th things don't always uh, aren't always what they appear. I mean, it's uh, it, it's 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 pretty fascinating to think about the distances traveled uh, by the digital signals before the radio signals can emanate. Well, and, the, and the key thing is that the, particularly my internet hookup here, uh, minimal latency, minimal 30, 40 milliseconds maybe. But the time I push the button here be from the, and the time it reacts down in my station at the remote site. In so, any case. so, so, uh, Gwen was just talking about the eclipse. Where were you or your radio or whatever for the eclipse in April? Well, I ran a couple of things. Uh, I ran WSPR off the station in Canada and uh, just in listening mode. And then I actually operated FT4 and FT8, I think just FT8 maybe on the uh, station down at Fairhaven. So the one in Canada, how far is it from CHU? Okay, forgive my ignorance. Where is CHU? In Ottawa. Oh, this is, uh, you know where Huntsville long is? Long way? Is it a long way? I have no idea. I'd say several hundred, not several hundred. I don't know. Hundreds of miles, huh? Huntsville. Huntsville is the nearest city of any size, but Ottawa is far, far east, and this is uh, about 150 miles north of Toronto. To to get a Canadian license. Do you have to speak French at all? No. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> the extent of my French is about pretty the time much. We dropped the code requirement, didn't they? Something I don't know. Uh, uh, the extent of my French is about merci. <laughs> That's a good one to know. That's a good one. That's funny. <laughs> oh, there's a VE2 there. <laughs> oh, oui, j'entends très bien. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, Gary. First of all, thank you for uh, sending around the data that I sent you this morning. You're you're quick on the ball there. I appreciate that. But uh, I wanted to comment on uh, Gwyn's uh, reporting on Whisper, WSPR. Uh, during the eclipse from Florida, I put up a hamstick dipole on 20 meters and ran the, the uh, WSPR 200 milliwatts on a 50% uh, percent data cycle uh, from uh, 8.30 a.m. local time to 9.20 p.m. local time. And uh, at the end of the, the uh, run, it had acquired about 23, it had acquired 2,300 uh, spots. 
uh, reported, but I have it by the by the hour. I have the table so I can see how they accumulated. And uh, then I ran it again two days later, same time, same configuration, got 3,300 spots. When I look back at the two sets of data, the rate of acquisition declined quite sharply on eclipse day during uh, the two hour or so uh, time. Uh, I haven't attempted to see if that is lo localized with any particular uh, re uh, receiving stations. I haven't dug down in the data for that, but uh, uh, was was puzzled by why that might be, since this since the spots were accumulated all over the eastern U.S. and some in, from Western Europe, and uh, that uh, uh, it it seemed that that it wasn't just uh, uh, for variation in time or weather or, or, or whatever uh, from the eclipse. But I, but I wondered whether the rate at which receiving stations can process data uh, is limited. In other words, if on eclipse day, a whole lot of more people were sending out whisper signals, whether that uh, would affect would essentially uh, blank out uh, reception of my signal for periods of time, whether it would have reduced the, the spot number of mine, the, a competition effect. So I've never heard of that happening. I don't know what the what the uh, reception rate is of uh, whispered uh, signals in general, but uh, to drop from 3,300 to 2,300, the actual rate of acquisition was going down to a half or a quarter uh, on eclipse day, what it had been for hours for a little while before the eclipse and a little while after the eclipse. and comparable acquisition rates uh, early and late beyond the eclipse on the reference day. So uh, the, those numbers actually, the uh, by the hour or so, the, the total number, the uh, cumulative number of spots is on the, the tables of data that I, that I sent uh, you that have the, the uh, S meter readings from 10 beacons on eclipse day and the reference day. So that, that data is in there also. And I, if anyone has, has a, a good response to that, uh, is it a limitation of the accession rate or is there something else that would have sent that plummeting down at uh, 20 meters on eclipse day? Dave, I think that there are probably several layers of responses uh, to, to those fascinating questions. Um, and I, I, mean, I, I don't see a, your, your call sign on, the, um, on your Zoom name, um, but I, I can ha have a look. I'd be willing to, you know, interested to have a look. So you, your transmit call sign from Florida was... W two HMT whiskey two hotel Mike Tango HMT um, I was and, and I ninety five Miami Florida right uh, okay. grid, grid um, ninety five I mean what one issue that I had again when it looked into was that there was definitely an upsurge in the number of whisper receiver stations active in North America on the eighth of April itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so you know if one, when I do a query on the database as to how many receivers in an hour reported anyone mm -hmm. as, as an indicator of general activity yeah. uh, compared to days either side, there was a definite upsurge. Uh, so, so that that's probably the most simple one um, as to congestion. I think that's incredibly difficult to judge. Uh, I mean, the the Whisper decoding software does two passes, uh, and on the first uh, uh, on the first pass after successful decodes, it then coherently removes that those signals from the entirety of the bitstream and then does another pass uh, to see what can be decoded. 
Uh, so if you like, it does, it can deal with almost overlapping signals mm -hmm. to quite an extent. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when you consider the 200 hertz whisper band and each signal is six hertz wide, mm -hmm. you know, you've got of the order of 30 absolutely maximum slots. Mm -hmm. And then maybe multiply that by sort of one and a half for uh, ability to decode from overlaps. And so if you if you're hitting 40 or so different stations in each two minute interval, you're right to ask about congestion and missed spots. Yeah, because if there were more receiving stations on Eclipse Day, that would that would argue for more points, more spots. Uh, reported, yeah. but there were about the same number of spots per hour. It, I'll have to look back at the data. It's been months now since, uh, mm -hmm. since I, I, I looked at it, but it seemed that uh, on early in the morning and later later in the day, the eclipse on eclipse day and the reference day, there was about the same rate of uh, acquisition. But then during the eclipse, on eclipse day, it uh, went went down per hour uh, for a while and came back up and by a substantial amount. So it made the difference in of a thousand hits over the over the total time. Thank you for that that uh, uh, description of how it how it works. I had not uh, and, I mean the other ways uh, that I have done analysis is by sort of uh, angular sector. So across the transatlantic, for instance, for me from the UK to look down the eclipse approach path, so yeah. to speak. Um, it was you know, on headings between 282 degrees and 298 degrees. Mm -hmm. So you can you know, select the spots that you want to re record to, to take into your analysis by heading. And then you can segment also by range interval. So I was doing it by 200 kilometer intervals from 4,600 out to 6,000 kilometers. Yeah. So you, you know you have that yeah. as well to give some selectivity mm -hmm. as to what you were seeing. Yeah. We were something like a little under a thousand kilometers from the eclipse path. Uh, about 50% coverage of the sun, solar coverage mm -hmm. max during the eclipse. Anyway, just uh, thought I'd throw that out. I don't know whether that affects, uh, would, would, could have at all affected Gladstone counting or, or, or not, but that's uh, uh, not so much my interest. Uh, I would rather see the science, <laughs> the, the, the science implications. Dave, do you have a graph of the number of spots per hour? I didn't. Uh, I didn't, but there's a table of data uh, that came along with uh, a uh, uh, report that Gary circulated today. I, I think to uh, the group, and that has one one column in the table which says total spots up to that that time, and. Uh, Adding up to thirty-three forty-nine on April tenth and twenty-three, I forget twenty-three hundred something on uh, April eighth. So could do it, or somebody else who has an interest can can keep me honest by doing it themselves. And here's a a. a preview perhaps Dave, of um i'm writing up the uh, just a very short article on the transatlantic um, effect of the eclipse on 15 meters for the rsgb radio society of great britain radcom magazine so here's a little preview of a of a figure there that um, on the right-hand scale is the spot count in 20-minute intervals, so mm. that I'm not aliasing those uh, those spikes. So uh, yeah. 20 minutes, it's the, uh, the the shortest time resolution that I can use. Uh, and you can see, you know, 320, 360 or so maximum there in 20 minutes, um, on a transatlantic on that heading that I mentioned. 
And uh, so before the eclipse, the eclipse comes in, the, the orange is the cosine of the solar zenith angle times the eclipse obscuration at the point of the second hop transatlantic. Oh, mm -hmm. So it follows that nicely, but stays down. And here we have just one spot, huh. just one spot uh, in that 20 minute interval. And, and that was at 6,964 kilometers. So the, the MUF had gone right down. And so it was the very longest path that I was looking at, just mm -hmm. one spot in 20 minutes. So, and, and then it recovers. You so, uh, you know, that's quite remarkable that across the Atlantic, in a four and a half to 6,000 kilometers, the eclipse had, had such a dramatic effect. Uh, so I, I'd urge you to look sort of selectively at the data mm -hmm. on, on particular sectors. Uh, because I'm sure you'll find it to be a, you know, a rich experience of what was going on. Very interesting. <laughs> I'm curious why you had the cause of solar zenith angle. Is it to do with the total ionization? Compensate for the solar zenith? Sorry. I'm, curi I'm curious why you had the cause of solar zenith angle. Does it have something to do with the reduction in the ionosphere cause of uh, solar zenith angle I, I think it really it's just the very crude approximation um of the uh incoming solar radiation falling uh on the ionosphere okay very crude very good any other questions for uh Gwen or Dave, otherwise I'd like to uh, recognize that somebody who joined us that we haven't seen in quite a while. Oh. Pat, Pat Rice, it's good request, to see you on the ham science call this afternoon. How have you been doing? Actually, Pat was a... I was just writing a chat while we were doing that. Yeah, I'm I'm really sorry. I I had a uh, an eclipse trip with 350 alumni and and rice and brass, so I wasn't able to do any ham observations during the, the eclipse and and uh uh we were going to have uh, uh somebody set up a ham site but she her boyfriend got sick so she couldn't come so we ended up not having any uh unfortunately any ham results from our location and we got clouded out to boot which was <laughs> sad but so anyway, yeah, life has been really crazy. And um, and as I put into the chat, I am teaching my physics of ham radio class uh, this semester. So if you know of a teacher who'd like to, you know, sit in on it via Zoom, I'd be happy to have them listen in. Um, they can also take it for, um, for a grade, but that's much better if they're in town so they can, you know, operate and whatnot. So we've... Uh, We've had our first couple of class meetings and done some FT8 and got some countries. And so, uh, so it's 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 been a, a lot of fun hooking up my old TS2000 to an old laptop and making everything talk to each other. Uh, but fun, fun. No, I, you, I, I know you. Uh, how many you, people are in the class? What? How many people are in the class? Uh, I've got. Five taking it for graduate credit and probably another five for professional development. So that's that's a good size class. So that's if I had too many more than then they can't all talk. But we were actually able to do a contact last night with, or with one teacher on Zoom and I was keying down. <laughs> he was making a contact through the Zoom through my radio. <laughs> uh, and that was fun. So so yeah, I've I've now split my radios. So I've got uh, the FT uh, the the TS two thousand is only HF, and I've got a ICOM ninety seven hundred, which is doing all the satellite work and all the UHF, VHF, and we got a steerable antenna. So hopefully we're going to be putting together an LSAT, uh CubeSat this year, and uh, so we're. Fingers crossed, uh, working with ARL to give us uh, to to for the transceiver module. Uh, we had originally going to go with EnduraSat, uh, but then our 
we had problems with our PCB on our on our CubeSat, so we missed the launch. But it was just as well because the Kansas students that used an Endurasat module have, as far as I know, never yet been able to successfully command the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. But the main folks who use the A <laughs> use the AMSAT transceiver are getting down data all the time, and it's an amateur repeater. So I think we're going to go that direction. <laughs> Winners, losers, I, who, who are you going to vote for, right? <laughs> so uh, between the between the CubeSat and the Eclipse, I was three feet under last year, but I'm, I'm hoping to see a little more light of day this year. Very good. Sounds like a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, David, did you have a, a question? I saw your hand was raised. Well, I have a comment. Uh, it's very interesting you bring this up um, because I was talking with one of our professors yesterday who was asking me when um, our field day would be. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but it was the end of uh, June. And he intimated that he had gotten interested in uh, ham radio uh, some time ago when he went up on a summit with a friend of his and they operated from there. And he said, but then uh, physics got in the way. And I said, but to me, radio is physics, to which he said, oh, right. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot. Of, in fact, one of the physics teachers who was debating taking it for a grade or for professional development, he says, you know, what will I get out of this to teach my students? And I'm going, really? <laughs> this is... This is, this is, you know, the cheapest physics hobby. You know, mm -hmm. all the physicists are either sailors or pilots. You know, you can be a ham operator for a few hundred bucks. You can't, you can't be a pilot for, for more than an hour for that. So, uh, you know, and, and it's electronics, it's waves, it's like, you know, there's, there's so much physics really that you can teach and, and it's just, you know, fun to talk around the world. Uh, you know, the only thing I have against FT8, I mean, it's almost too easy. You know, I we were making contacts through some nets and we had to wait our turn, you know how it is. And then after after they left, I put it on FT8 and I made like eight contacts in 15 minutes. And I'm going, but you know, I, I had no actual interaction with those people on FT8. You know, I that does take a little bit out of the hobby part is making a contact for which there is actually no humanity involved. Yeah, there's a there's a, there's a great deal of, well, at least there's, there's certainly some effort and some skill in assembling an FT8 station and all that and the antennas and, and being able to make a lot of contacts. There's no question that uh, it's, it's definitely a, a, a very active and, and, and interesting part of ham radio. But uh, yeah, you, you don't have someone's voice or someone's hand at the key. And it's just, it's just one of those things. So it's, it's, the good thing is we have options. We have so many modes, so many bands and whatnot to practice and, and work on. Uh, everybody, can, everybody can find their niche, which is, which is wonderful. So if, if my class is Monday nights and we're on the air, but we do theory from six to 7.30 and then we're on the air from 7.30 to nine. So. If anybody is on single sideband or whatnot and wants to try to find a date and time, I'll be happy to see if we can make a make a contact. Excellent, awesome. Okay, any other questions for Pat or anything else uh, for general discussion? We're getting close to our getting close to our hour today. Nope. Good. I know we've got at least one satellite operator online. I know Mackenzie's done some satellite work too in the past. So uh, making contacts through. I, I've done it too at field day. It's uh, it's interesting at field day when there's so many people trying to get through the bird to the transponder, but it uh, it does work. So at least I can say I've done it a couple of times in my 47 years as a ham. <laughs> okay. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, we'll, we'll call it for close tonight. We'll, we'll cut the recording and say thanks, everyone, for, for contributing, for speaking up, and, and actually a lot of good questions and still uh, some technical back and forth, too, which is what we like. So 
Uh, next week is going to be a good week. I know Ed and Mackenzie have been working on promoting it already. Uh, former Rice University, Jason Durr, will be on to talk about uh, the uh, the magnetic storm back on May 10th and how it affected the bands and uh, many other things, too. So that will be certainly very interesting. No question mm -hmm. about it next uh, next Thursday. Awesome. So there's nothing else. We'll say 73, and uh, everyone have a great week. Yep. Good night. Have an interesting.